Hey, very nice to be here. Um, this is my first time at Foss North. Um, I was convinced to do this by my, my dear friend Henrik, um, but it's nice to meet all of you. Uh, hopefully this will be somewhat interesting. I am going to talk to you about open source program offices and the importance of them in an enterprise. I work for a big enterprise. I'm coming up on 25 years at Intel and I've been uh, working in open source for about the last decade and leading our open source program office for the last eight years. So real quick, agenda, I'm gonna talk about understanding the OSPO, the benefits of having an OSPO, important considerations for establishing an OSPO, and then I'll talk about the way that we do things at Intel. Could be a useful blueprint if you are a company of about 120,000 employees with about 20,000 software developers. Just kidding. Actually, I think some of the information is relevant for businesses of any size. So, understanding the OSPO. How do we define an open source program office? I define it as being a centralized organizational unit within the company that's responsible for setting open source strategy, setting open source consumption and production policies, um, establishing governance, and implementing compliance plans. The purpose of the OSPO, contrary to developer belief, is not to slow them down, it's not to be a wet blanket, um, it's actually to help facilitate cooperation uh, with the open source community. Its purpose is to help the company be a good citizen, in the open source community and to help developers be successful contributors and participants in the community. You might have guessed from what I just said what some of the key responsibilities are. Um, open source license compliance is absolutely the number one thing that we care about or that we educate developers about. We want to make sure that when our developers are using open source software, they're adhering not only to the letter but the spirit of the licenses. So that means that we do a lot of education a lot of education about the open source and free software movements, the different philosophies behind them. Um, it's, it, it's a journey. Um, I don't know how many people here have ever seen the movie Groundhog Day? And, oh, you have, great. So that's very much what the last eight years have been like for me. It's like a fresh new batch of developers and teaching the story and telling the story and bringing them along. Um, but at the end of the day, you know, we are hopefully imparting wisdom on them, and I think some people do actually have a light bulb go on in their head, like, oh wow, open source is really cool, I'm getting this thing for free, and I'm part of this big movement, and ah, that's great. Um, besides open source, license compliance, coming up with policies for the company, as I mentioned, so in terms of consumption, uh, what are you allowed to use, what are you not allowed to use, I'm actually really proud of the fact that at Intel we don't have any rules about what you're not allowed to use, um, as long as it is an OSI or an FSF recognized free license. Um, everything is context dependent, so we don't say like, oh no, stay away from the AGPL, um, as long as it's, like I said, OSI or FSF blessed, it's, uh, it's good enough for us. Um, we're actually also trying to make it easy for developers to participate in open source. Again, I know that might seem counterintuitive, especially to some of our developers, we see us as bureaucratic, causing friction, but no, we're actually trying to help them go faster. Um, and one of the ways we do that, if we think about the components of our open source program office, it's really, oops, sorry, bringing together um, members of legal, engineering, and developer relations. Um, and it, it, basically a, a consolidation of open source knowledge within the company. Which is not to say that there aren't pockets of excellence outside of the open source program office, but we are sort of a one-stop shop. And then we have friends and family that we use as force multipliers who are out in the various business units. Benefits of having an open source program office. Probably the most obvious one is risk mitigation. Again, this is tied back with license compliance. We're trying to make sure that developers are doing the right thing right. Um, and very closely related to that are reputation and brand management. Uh, or brand enhancement, I'm sorry, not brand management. I don't want marketing to do that at me. Um, 
but by mitigating risks, we help preserve Intel's reputation in the open source community. Uh, we hopefully grow it, make it better, and again, make sure the company does the right thing. Um, I know my colleagues Henrik and Alexius uh, spend a lot of time, you know, explaining to managers like, well, you know, yeah, you could do this thing, but here's why it would be the wrong thing to do, or here's why it's important for us to do right by the community. The OSPO is sort of like uh, Jimmy Cricket's voice, you know, conscience in the ear of uh, the corporation. I've also heard that having an OSPO is good for talent attraction and retention. The fact that we have an OSPO or the fact that an organization has an OSPO says to developers, hey, open source is important to this company. And the OSPO actually plays a role in advocating for developers, getting them able to work on open source projects um, either in their own time or on company time. So we can help uh, make people want to come work for us. And uh, I would not be a proper salesy sort of person if I didn't say that it helps with accelerated innovation. Um, the fact that you know many hands make light work, uh, we are able to leverage open source technology, why we create you know things that have already been created. Promoting uh, open source best practices within the company via inner source. Um, a lot of companies that have large open source program offices also have inner source initiatives. And again, fostering collaboration with external communities. So getting out and talking to people, meeting people at conferences, making connections, and helping to pave the way for our developers to make inroads. Important considerations for establishing an OSPO. How many people here work for companies who have OSPOs? Awesome. Okay, well, I know you do a lot of OSPOs. You do. What are, okay. And what are the average size of these companies that you work for? More than 5,000 employees? Yeah? More than 10,000? Awesome. How big are your OSPOs? Half a dozen people? Ten? Okay, that's pretty good. For a long time, the official OSPO at Intel was, was like me and Alexios. <laughs> but we've, we've got some critical mass. Um, but what's really important is leadership support. Um, in the best case, you have support from both legal and from engineering. Uh, I can tell you that it's terrible when you lose that leadership support. <laughs> we had a, a sort of dark period for a few years where, you know, again, we were like a skeleton crew and, and basically working just to keep the lights on. But we've had a bit of a renaissance in the past few years, so that's, that's exciting. But um, leadership support is really necessary because resources are, are required. And even though we have many wonderful volunteers who help us, you know, fellow travelers, um, yeah, we require resources and commitment. We cost money. Um, but it, it's always good, like I said, if you have both legal and engineering allies that can help you um, get funding. Clear objectives and strategy. Something else important, we do this all the time, um, is basically connecting the dots with management or with executives, explaining what the value is um, or how the hospital will contribute to business outcomes. But that's really important too. If you can't articulate that, then you're probably not going to get ongoing leadership support. Um, in terms of community engagement, you need to be ready to get out there, to build communities, to participate in the community, to fund events, participate in events, um, build and nurture relationships. If you're not ready to do that, then you're probably not ready to be running an OSPO. Governance and compliance goes without saying. Um, you need to have people who are experts or who have expertise in open source software, in open source licensing, in the culture, and the values, and the ability to influence both up and down the chain, so developers and executives. That's very much related also to resources and skills. Turns out you can't just hire any rando off the street to work in an open source program office, um, which I've tried to do, <laughs> um, and it, it hadn't worked out really well because you know I wasn't born knowing about this stuff, right? But it does take a rare, a rare breed um, where you have knowledge and passion and you know, are, are interested in carrying, carrying the torch, carrying the message, and helping spread the good word of open source. 
And then, of course, continuous evaluation and improvement. There's no one set it and forget it. You have to constantly be looking at what are you doing? Are those things effective? How can you improve? How can you remove even more friction? How can you be more in service of the developers that you're supporting? Um, and keeping abreast, keeping up with all of the many changes that are always going on in the world of open source. So it's always changing, yet, like Groundhog Day, it's kind of always the same. Still, I think it's the best job we've ever had. So, a case study talking about Intel's open source program office, because I'm sure you're all like, oh my god, Jessica is such a dynamic speaker, I must hear how they do things. Um, it's a horizontal function in our company. So, we straddle all the business units. Um, as I mentioned, we have sort of fellow travelers. We have, um, I would you call them deputies, Alexios? People who are of like mind, who work in the business units, who they're like a satellite outreach for us. But overall, the mothership, we're a horizontal function with responsibility that spans all the business units. And as I mentioned, we've got about 20,000 developers at Intel, so size and scope are big challenges for us. Um, and there's 20,000 different levels of open source knowledge and experience across the company. Um, so again, education, something that we're constantly doing. And with the size and scope, there's a need for your policies and practices to scale. You can't just be doing one-offs. Things very much have to be repeatable and um, self-service as much as possible. So we try to give people the tools that they need so that they can do the right thing themselves. Not for secret. The thing that I think makes our OSCO really special, and I'm not taking anything away from anybody else's OSCO, because maybe you do this too, but we run our OSCO like an open source project. And what I mean by that is we apply open source development principles to our operations. So we've got a BDFL, um, we've got maintainers, we've got committers, and we've got some people who I would consider contributors. Um, we coordinate across functions, like I said, with engineering and legal and marketing. Um, like you know, any open source project, we have our documentation, we try to be welcoming to new members of the community, we try to tell people how they can participate, and we try to be really transparent about the way the decisions are made. We also do developer outreach, advocacy, um, internal community engagement, you know, getting people excited about open source. And we implement standard workflows and use devel uh, developer-friendly or familiar tools. So for example, we use Jira and Git in our internal operations. Um, but yeah, like an open source project, you know, you start hanging out the open source program office and participating, and then you might get invited to become a member of the open source program office. Um, and that's that's sort of how you Evolve. That's that's what happened to me. I started hanging out <laughs> with the open source program office for a couple of years, and then when um, the leader retired, I tapped in, and I, I got to lead it. Our OSCO, but you couldn't guess. We've got representation from engineering, from legal, from security. Security is big for us. Um, it's largely virtual. We've got members across the world, Henrik here in Sweden, Alexios in Munich, about a handful of people in um, Oregon, a couple in California, one on the East Coast, and as I mentioned, we've got this sort of extended team of volunteers, and they're all over the world. And I already talked about how the members increase their status based on the quality of their contributions, but again, you know, you hang out, you participate, you grow your cred, and you, um, Get to join the team. And it's actually, uh, believe it or not, folks consider it an honor if they're asked to become like a voting member of the Open Source Program Office. And um, actually, voting member, that's an important thing to talk about too. When we review projects, we follow the same, you know, two thumbs up, no thumbs down uh, when we approve projects. Again, we have this internal and external focus. I'm externally focused right now. Um, but internal, we're doing a lot of process evangelism and a lot of education. We provide forums within the company for people to, you know, ask their questions, um, get answers, and as I mentioned, one of those important considerations is a constant 
evolution, so we are always iterating on our processes. Three main components for our program. Number one, that you can't guess, mandatory education, of course, um, which is primarily open source licensing basics, but also handling third party IP, and uh, of course our various <coughs> internal processes. Our second main component is getting people comfortable with the idea of planning their IP, um, that they shouldn't just wait until they do a scan before they send something out the door to know what's in their code. We want them to be taking notes, uh, keeping track of where they're getting things, what they're getting, and avoiding surprises at the 11th hour. And then our last component, um, I mentioned those you know, two thumbs up. We do a peer review by a panel of experts, and that panel talks about various things, answers questions, gives feedback on you know, what the likely community response to a particular action is going to be. Uh, we look at architecture and, uh, again, provide more education, a lot of education. I think I should have been a teacher in another life. <sighs> I'm almost done. Recommendations for companies of any size. Again, we're a pretty large company, but doesn't matter how, how big or how small you are, even if you're an OSPO of one. Um, you can put some of these principles to work for you. You need a governance and compliance policy. If, if you're more than one developer, you, you absolutely need to have a policy. If you don't have one yet, get to work. Um, we think having the OSPO run like an open source project is pretty fun. Has been successful for longer than I've been running it. Um, yeah, oh my gosh, almost 20 years we've had an OSPO or something like it. Um, you'll be successful if you can cultivate an internal community that role models the best of open source, and you should actively participate in external initiatives and develop uh, events that develop and promote best open source practices. So things like SPDX, things like Open Chain, um, I'm drawing a blank at other things. I'm getting really tired. But anyway, <laughs> that's my talk. Thanks for listening. Hope you all have a pleasant afternoon and good luck with your own hospital. Anyone has a question? Thank you. Uh, you said you run the OSPO like an open source project, mm -hmm. and unfortunately, you, like many open source projects, use proprietary software, or use Jira, other open source uh, projects use GitHub, which is proprietary, you use, you use Git, so I guess it's the, the open version, oh, free version. Um, but, uh, so this, this is a common practice in free or open source projects to use proprietary software, and you've repeated that practice internally. Um, is that, was that your intent, or do you think you should be like promoting some actually using free or open source internally? Well, you probably noticed my use of proprietary PowerPoint. Um, <laughs> unfortunately, working at a large company, there's some lack of freedom in terms of what we can do, um, in terms of what software can be landed on corporately managed infrastructure. There is I hate to say, I think that's certain reluctance that if you aren't paying for service and support for something, then it might not be real software, or people are, you know, reluctant to host it. So would I like to have my own GitLab instance? Yes. GitLab is not or Gitia. Gitia. That's a little better, maybe. Okay. You should check the GNU ethical repository criteria. Oh uh, well, sadly. Uh, yeah, so anyone who works in a large company, you probably know getting anything landed on corporately managed infrastructure can be a very painful process. And so we sort of pick and choose our battles. I don't think it would be possible for us to do our work as efficiently as we do right now if we didn't use some proprietary software. 
but we do try to use open source software as much as we can. You know, I mean, I know the small things. Notepad++ is what I use for doing my notes. Um, we do actually publish stuff using LibreOffice, but um, sometimes the, the inertia is hard to overcome. And you can still use proprietary software while you're telling the larger message. If I had to use only free software, I probably wouldn't have 20,000 developers listening to me about you know, what the goodness of the free open you know, source software movement is, why they should care, because um, I just, I wouldn't be working at all. <laughs> Systems, plural. Um, there are multiple build systems within the company, and that's out of scope of the open source program office to provide the tooling for for that. There we have one more hand. Okay, I uh, heard someone uh, say. Uh, few months ago that um, firstly open source was one and secondly we don't really need OSPOs anymore because we've come so far in, in open source. Do you think Intel will at some point come to a point where they say that well, we're so good at this now that we actually don't need an OSPO? Well, I, I could pull out a long list of examples of how how they do continue to need NOSCO or things that they're not good at. Um, I hope that doesn't happen because, like I said, this has been one of the most enjoyable jobs I've ever had. Um, I think I think it won't um, because I think that there's still so much changing in the world of free and open source software. Um, there's still so, especially with license changes, um, that management doesn't pay attention to them. I mean, that's a lot of what we do with the OSPO is up leveling to them or saying, like, oh, by the way, do you know this thing is no longer free? It's now FOPEN. Um, so we actually have that vocabulary happening um, and explaining it. They're like, well, what do you mean? And I'm like, well, it's source available. It's not really open source. And here's, you know, the problems with it. Um, I think there will always be a need for an OSPO. I see one more hand. Oh. Want to share? Have mercy. <laughs> so tired. Uh, sorry, I think it will be a bit of the opposite kind of question, but a little bit like, uh, what do you think would be the main challenges for uh, also uh, in the next two to five years? I'm asking because, um, like, back in the days you and I used to work together. I would say like five or eight years ago, it was just about making sure that we even understood that open source existed. Uh, now it's usually a bit more interesting, and I think a couple of uh, hands uh, showed that it's taken more seriously now. But what would be, from your perspective, uh, the next challenges in the next two to five years within the big world? Well, actually, I guess this is less specific to open source and just more with software in, in general. But yeah, open source software security is a huge thing. And so, yes, even though there's probably someone somewhere who's like, we can get rid of the OSPO and save a whole bunch of you know personnel dollars, um, I'm finding that we're doing a lot of work now preparing for compliance with the CRA and with various uh, initiatives or executive directives, is that what they call them? Whatever executive orders coming out of, of Washington. Um, you know, just understanding that the whole principle of provenance and maintaining software bills of material is something that in the open source or the OSPO space we've cared about for years and years and years and it's only going to become more important. So we have expertise that 
that other people don't have. And again, that passion and, and interest, um, I just, you, I don't think you can pick any rando off the street and do it. So, yes, definitely a career for hospitals in the future. Um, but we're, <laughs> it's, it's much more than just licensing, it's, it's also a license, it's um, security is, is a huge and big important thing. Yeah. Oh God, AI, thanks a lot too. I think we close for today then. Okay. Just a big hand. Yeah.